Right, so I think I'll um, invite my co-panelists to the um, high table. That's um, Dr. Aaron Singh, um, and, and he's from uh, the Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland, Ohio. He's the director of the Department of Ophthalmic Oncology. And then I would also invite Dr. Louis Texera, an ophthalmologist from Brazil. Okay. So I'll just give you a very brief introduction. Let's see. Um, okay, so our session was to talk about the status of RB in developing countries. Um, someone had been contacted by a family in a developing country whose child has retinoblastoma, and what could the person do to help them? It's a very real-life scenario. We get this all the time, and it's not only from developing to developed countries, but even among developing countries, we get referrals. Pleasant situation. We do see um, just a bright spot, and so unilateral intraocular retinoblastoma, and this is a child afterwards with the prosthetic eye looking quite good from a rural part of the country, but still has managed, and she's doing very well. Um, this is a dilemma. Lovely baby, about eight months old, bilateral retinoblastoma, still intraocular. What are the options in developing countries? <sighs> Something we see far too often than we would want to. Late presentation. And as you can see, there's the supracellar CNS disease, dismal prognosis, so unfortunately palliative care. You can see the tumor is even almost larger than the head with some metastasis, etc. Uh, so anyway, we don't just leave things to chance. We are actively involved in awareness creation. So we have to be quite graphical because our population is uh, illiterate. They can only um, relate to things that they see, and then it would make them come rather than the words. And this I saw in a rural area. So Ministry of Health helped us in distributing these to all their health centers. So hopefully that's helping things go along. So what are some of our issues? General lack of awareness, both in the pub, amongst the public and health workers. We get too many children referred late because they've been to maybe the weighing clinic. The nurse has said it's nothing, it's normal, lack of knowledge, and they've come when it's late. Delays both due to the family and the, at the health facilities. Um, there are very few screening programs in developing countries. Poor referral systems, so delays. And obviously, um, and ophthalmologists, um, the availability throughout the in, in developing countries is limited to some extent. And then acceptability of enucleation, when they're told their child uh, is going to be enucleated, some parents do not return. The lack of um, the ability to do the necessary scans, including head scans, pathologists. Today we heard a lot about whether it's more than three millimeters involvement of the choroid and et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, our pathologists don't go into such details for us. They'll tell you if there's optic nerve involvement anyway. But. And then obviously when we get these advanced eyes, you need pediatricians or pediatric oncologists with the required training in adequate numbers, access to chemotherapy and um, make it as le not toxic hopefully, so that the children don't die from febrile episodes. Multidisciplinary approach, having all the, well, you just have to make do with what you have in, in your setting. Radiation therapy options. We do know that there are several countries in, for instance, Africa, where there are no radiotherapy machines, so that might not be an option for some children. Focal treatment, uh, restrictions with availability, Treatment options for metastatic disease, hardly any. And the socioeconomic problems, the financial implications. So just like um, with all other programs, building oncology programs, you need the hospital, you need local support, local foundations and um, international partners. And, and the government plays a key role as well. And this just shows the retinoblastoma program with all the multidisciplinary team, but you have to make do with what you have in your setting. 
This shows a country-to-country -country referral. We had a referral from a country, Liberia, a couple of years ago. I had to cover this up. It was huge. You can see all the way down here. Um, and he had intracranial, obviously, problems, um, metastasis. But we couldn't just let him go like that. We gave some cycles of chemotherapy, and Dad was so appreciative because now he was able to go back to Liberia wearing his glasses. And you won't believe, even after the boy died, he called me when the boy died, but he felt his quality of life had been improved. During the Ebola crisis, Dad kept on calling me to tell me his family was okay. Even this year, Dad calls from time to time. He's appreciative that at least we improved the boy's um, quality of life. And um, yes, yeah, so even when we think there's nothing, there's a, there, there is something we can always do to help such families. So today we're going to talk about what we have to offer. So um, Dr. Aaron Singh will start off us, us off, sorry, will start us off by talking about the global burden of retinoblastoma. Then we'll have um, Dr. Luis Tixera from Brazil talking about early diagnosis and his experience in Brazil with public health initiatives. Unfortunately, um, Dr. Carlos Rodriguez had, could not make it at the last minute. Duty called. He sent some slides, so I'll do my best with presenting those. But I'm sure it will be a time for discussion when I get to that session. Thank you very much. So over to Dr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to participate. I'm going to expand on the theme that's come in the morning session about international cooperation, global aspects of retinoblastoma, socioeconomic status. And I'm going to show you one, st one throw, one statistic even before I start. You know how much percent of Indians live on one dollar a day? I'm originally Indian. I've been living in the US for 25 years. So I can call myself both, I guess. So 90% of Indians live on one dollar a day that's more than a billion people. And here we sit and talk about treatment that costs hundreds and thousands of dollars. But if there's 90% of country lives on $1 a day, that even $1 is too expensive for them. So that answers our question about socioeconomic aspect of treatment. So obviously, what works here or what might be applied here has very little application outside. And it's important because the burden really is outside at the United States rather than here. So in the next 10, 15 minutes, we'll talk a little bit about the incidence, risk factors, mortality, and some of the future directions. Um, so incidence, we know overall retinoblastoma is a rare disease and often disease. In the United States, we'd say about 1.5% of all childhood cancers. And this is a, a graph from a recent study from the International uh, Center in, uh, in France, and you can see the, within the common cancers, you don't even see retinoblastoma. And in the rare disease, the red kind of shows up, pretty much across different uh, continents and nations. The rate is approximately 1 in 16,000. One can say 17,000, 18,000, but in their range per birth. But if you look at, according to the SEER database, which we mostly use nowadays, is 11.8 per million in age 0 to 4. There's no difference between the races in the United States, this is black is the black population and white is the white population there, the graph. And so pretty much identical across races. And the incidence in the United States has not gone up statistically. It's to maintained itself for last almost 20, 30 years. So we, it's not getting more common, okay? That's it. But in the, if you look at the global aspect of incidence, and this is patients per year in the United States. So this is all the patients in the world and that's approximately 7,202. This is 2006 calculation by Kivela, whom I asked to write an editorial for the BJO, and I used to edit the journal at that time. And he wrote a very nice uh, editorial with all these calculations. And this is based upon the incidence, the, pop the incidence rate, the birth rate, the crude uh, birth rate, survival rate, infant mortality, population, et cetera, et cetera. And you can come up with a number, uh, which is an approximation, but nevertheless a good guide that in the US, you expect 258 cases per year out of total burden of 7,000, which is 3.5%. So a small percent. This includes Canada too, North America, I guess, right? And then we go to Asia, we're excluding Japan because Japan is a very developed nation. The rest of the Asia, 
to say 4,000 cases. So 66% of all retinoblastoma in the world will happen in Asian countries. And then look at the Africa, it's around the 25%. So that's 90%. So 90% of retinoblastoma is in Asia and Africa. And we are talking about only 3.5% of cases. That's not surprising, US is only 5% of the world population. And what about this, is it increasing or is it decreasing globally? Again, according to an estimate, the numbers are actually reducing globally. That's because the birth rate is going down, particularly in China. And so the, then it's coming down just marginally, approximately 0.75% per year. So this year going forward, you'll say approximately 30 cases less per year out of 7,000. Okay, so there is slight reduction. Uh, this apl applies to China mostly, but in India the rates are the same because the birth rate is not going down. Okay. And it's mostly different from China, Vietnam, Iran, Sri Lanka, all these countries, the numbers are going down because the population growth rate is slowing down in some ways. So that's the global burden incidence, you say Africa and Asia, 90%. And we know the risk factors are age, we know that most of them will happen by age four and maybe even up to like nine, maybe some rare cases of unilateral sporadic, and the younger they are, more likely to be bilateral and germline. This is well known. This also comes out of the SEER database that we published several years ago. And we know it's autosomal dominant. Here's a mother with two children with disease. And we always talk about family history. That's only positive in 10% of cases. So 90% of cases do not have pre-existing family history. 90% are sporadic spreading the sense that they do not have existing family history, but they could be new germline mutations. So that's where the genetics comes in, and I'm sure you'll hear about it, and the genetic testing, et cetera. We've been in the Cleveland Clinic for the last 15 years using uh, impact genetics. Before it was something else, retinoblastoma solutions, now it's impact genetics. And we've been using this lab uh, for our testing. And this is very helpful, uh, and as you'll hear later on in other, other lectures, that why is it important to genetic testing, but it helps us plan the, the, the frequency and the severity of interventions and examinations. The family trees are usually, you know, young families, first child, second child, et cetera. You don't, normally don't have uh, extensive uh, pedigrees. But this is a, one of the first cases that I saw uh, when I was a fellow in United States. This man, as you will see, has had five children with four different women, and all of them happened to have retinoblastoma. And I was surprised. Uh, how he could fi even find these women uh, to have children with. That was my, I was a young man then. So <laughs> think about this. <laughs> but this is true. And I asked my attending, I said like, how come we tell him not to have some more? And he said, you know, his insurance wouldn't cover vasectomy. <laughs> Can you believe that? This is a true, true case, okay, this is not, and you know, what the word pedigree is like a French kind of word. French, not kind of word, it's a French word. There's French people here, I saw Dr. Doss. <laughs> and that means like the foot of a goose, right? And that's exactly like a foot of a goose, huh? Uh, you can imagine, that's a pedigree for, for you. That's the origin of the word pedigree, right? Dr. Doss, am I correct? Yeah, okay. No, I verified it, it's correct. <laughs> anyway. And mortality is, of course, important. That's the most significant aspect of retinoblastoma. Of course, that's what they're concerned about. And that's the primary aim of treatment, really, is to, to reduce the mortality. And of course, we, some of it is due to by, by the course of the disease, and some of it could be treatment-induced, as we have learned in the past. And just like in incidence, there is variation in, in uh, mortality across the globe. In developed nations, United, in in US, for example, we say mortality rate is 2%, 3% at the most, you know, I'll show you some graphs. But in developing nations, it can be as high as 90%. So again, let's I'll come back to the same graphs here. So this is the burden of mortality in the United States, very little here. You know, expected to see eight cases dying of metastasis this per year, this mathematical calculation. So that takes you to the study that they were talking about earlier on about risk chemotherapy for high risk cases, et cetera. When the event rate is so low, it's impossible to do studies. So you really have to go outside the United States to get cases and then be able to derive from them and then be able to adopt it to our usage here. So we really, it's, I think the impetus is on us. We have the resources, maybe know-how, to reach out to these centers 
uh, and kind of work with them to get the data and, and in the help them and then help us in the same process. So it's a mi minority of my, uh, deaths are coming out of the United States. And look at uh, Asia here. Again, 50% of the cases in Asia, three out of 3,000, will die of retinoblastoma. And that's uh, about 15,000, uh, 1,500 cases. And then in, in Africa, approximately 42% of all cases will die. Again, based on certain estimates, but still gives you a number. Again, so that means more than 90% of the deaths from retinoblastoma are happening in Africa and Asia. So not only they have more number of cases, they also have a higher proportion of mortality. And in the United States, we know that over the years, from 1980 to, uh, to 2000 to 2010, the survival has improved almost at look at five years, you say in a 97% survival. So 3% mortality uh, is a very low mortality. And I think of many childhood cancers, I think retinoblastoma is one of them uh, that's potentially curable. If it's a unilateral disease confined to the globe, does not have high risk factors, enucleation, and that's the end of the story. So it's curable. Uh, in fact, in a large proportion of cases, and we'll talk about that too. So how do these children die? They die of one of these three things, a metastasis, trilateral retinoblastoma, and second malignant neoplasms. In the United States, most of the deaths are from second malignant neoplasms, not from, retino not from metastasis or TRV, which is very different in, in the other parts of the world, as you know. So let's move on here. We talked about metastasis, and just to go show you some pictures, it can be bone marrow, CNS disease, and the risk factors we know are, you know, neovascular glaucoma is a clinical risk factor, but histopathology like orbital extension um, and deep choroidal invasion, et cetera, massive choroidal invasion, more than three millimeters, optic nerve extension, extra, all, all those are risk factors that we talked about it earlier on. So come back to these risk factor on pathology. Looking at the data in US, one can say approximately 18% of eyes have the high risk pathology. Compared to India, 50% of eyes have high-risk pathology. So that's what's driving the mortality, obviously. These eyes are advanced diseases, and therefore they have a high-risk factor, therefore they have metastasis. So we're talking about multi-center studies or international studies, you have to look at this, keep in mind the natural history is different. These tend to be more advanced than, than in the US. So this is a good comparison to say that risk factors are less common in the United States but much more advanced, and there could be other countries too with similar uh, inference one could draw. So metastasis, we know, therefore correlates with the ocular disease. Metastasis, therefore, could be reduced if you could detect the disease early. So in some ways, metastasis is preventable, and one can say retinoblastoma is potentially, therefore, curable from that perspective. Talking about trilateral disease, we know that once you get it, it's typically germline induced and its prognosis is poor. So it's really not something that you can prevent. You might screen them early on with MRIs every six months, but that may or may not have the impact on outcome. But generally speaking, the mortality from TRB is not really something that you can control. And second, malignant neoplasms, you heard about osteosarcomas and other things that can happen, and there are studies done uh, by Dr. Kleinerman's work, which I have copied from her paper, bone tumors, leiomyosarcoma, et cetera, with radiation, radiation alone or radiation with alkylating agent chemotherapy. So we know that's the impetus to move away from radiation, and now we are moving towards chemotherapy, and that was the big impetus uh, in 1990s to move away from radiation. And in fact, that's what's happening in the United States. This is, uh, again, 2015 paper. We can say the enucleation rates have kind of stayed the same over time, approximately 90% here but the rates of radiation have gone down, whereas the rates of chemotherapy have gone up. So if you're looking for national trends in the United States, this is the SEER database, Surveillance, Epidemiology, and End Result Program of NCI that samples 26% of US population. It's the gold standard for all data. All NIH funding, NCI funding is based on data derived from this. So breast cancer programs, prostate, colon, everything is derived from this database. And when I went to them, I wanted to study uveal melanoma first. Nobody wanted to help me because nobody wanted to study uveal melanoma. But we managed to get some help. Uh, Tofam is a registrar uh, in, this, in the SEER database uh, setup, and he was able to analyze the data. But this is a retinoblastoma, and other people have since then also published. But generally talking about trends in populations, this is the best data that we have for the United States. So for mortality, we had just talked about metastasis is preventable. SMN, second malignant neoplasms, are partially preventable if you avoid radiation. 
Uh, I'm not so sure if chemotherapy itself is inducing it, but some chemo agents like etoposide may have leukogenic effects. Uh, trilateral is not really preventable. So some aspects can therefore be addressed to reduce the mortality. So if the mortality, if every child could get the best care possible wherever they are in the world, and we could reduce their mortality to, to the US level, for example, saying the US has the best outcomes or Canada has the best outcomes, Dr. Galli, I don't want to offend you. Uh, <laughs> so Northern, uh, uh, North America. So if, if the numbers can, can be reduced quite a bit, obviously you're not going to detect every case early on, but if you were to provide the best care, you could reduce mortality to half very easily from 3,000 cases dying per year to approximately 1,200 uh, 1, per year. Again, so these are all mathematical estimates, but tells you that it can be done if you were to kind of think more in a global way. So mortality obviously comes from early detection, can be reduced through early detection, education, and access to healthcare. So with all this in mind, I went to India, and Dr. Galli was part of it, uh, our efforts trying to kind of work and develop the outcomes, trying to improve the outcomes, basically data-driven in a collective way, and to kind of do a study, a prospective study. And I have to say that because of institutional rivalry, okay, this institution wouldn't work with this one, wouldn't work with that one, and wouldn't work with anyone, that kind of stuff. It never really took off, but finally, I realized that I'm gonna work with only one institution, which is the largest one in, in India, sees as many cases as the United States in Delhi, all in the institute. Bhavna Chawla is, is the director of that program, she's here, and we're going to work together through special Indo-US scientific grants. There are specific grants for India and US as collaborative exchange. We're trying to tap into some of those resources to develop a study, at least in one center, to kind of improve the outcomes. And again, just like uh, Lorna mentioned, we kind of thinking of five phases over, uh, over several years. And uh, you know, we need you have data, you need security questions, we need some philanthropy, and we'll be able to kind of come up with some innovations that are applicable to local populations because 90% of India and most of the world lives only just on a dollar a day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to, to be here and to um, share with you all my experience in the last uh, 10 years that we are working with this. And I was happy to see the, uh, the presentations in the morning. Congratulations for all your work in Honduras. Brazil is part of the Latin America and South America. And if we see the mortality under five years old in our region, we are going to see that is uh, huge, the mortality here. Uh, and why this is important? This is important because for our governments, uh, some diseases are hair diseases, hair conditions. So they are not going to pay attention in all these kind of hair conditions like retinoblastoma. They need to pay attention in infectious diseases and other diseases that kill more kids than retinoblastoma. Uh, so we call this epidemiological transition. Latin America is uh, in this uh, transition. What uh, it means that we are transition from um, cardio, uh, uh, sorry, for communicable and perinatal disease to cardiovascular disease and malignant tumors. And this transition will take time. And so for our government to pay attention in cancer, it will be take more time than in developed countries. Here you can see the mortality um, comparing El Salvador, Brazil, and USA. If you see infection is a high cause of mortality in, in kids under five year old in Brazil. And here's the amount of cases in South America. Probably we have 600 cases per year and probably in Brazil one third of this case, probably uh, between 200 and 300 cases are in Brazil. 
Brazil is a, a huge country, it's a continental co country, and we have a multicultural uh, uh, population. This is the distribution of the Indian population, the, the native uh, indigenous groups. So you can imagine how difficult and uh, is to um, uh, treat these uh, different cultures. And also we have here uh, our uh, distribution of the Human Development Index inside the country. You can see that you have uh, health parts of the countries and parts of the country that has uh, no development. So we are going to receive kids from all these areas. So it's different to receive a kid from Amazon and receiving a kid from Sao Paulo. This is two points that are extremely important when we think in, in uh, developed countries. Changes such as limited access to early detection and effective treatment cause poor prognosis. Another thing is uh, 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 you need to provide the support for this kid to maintain the treatment. So I think three points are important. Early detection, access to treatment, and treatment compliance. We are going to see what we have been doing for these 10 years. For early detection, uh, we try to improve education. Education from the population, for family, and primary care providers. We always put primary care providers, but because much of these kids don't have doctors. They have uh, nurses or technicians or even uh, other kind of providers that make the first care of this child. So we make this uh, uh, review, the survey in 10 countries, one of the countries were Brazil, and one third of healthcare providers continue to observe the child even if the uh, mother or the parent said about leukocoria. So it's uh, a huge number of kids that is still being observed even if the parent looked for a health system. And even in New York, this number is similar. 30% of primary care physicians delay referring, even if the patient or the parents uh, uh, said about the, the complaints. Uh, we observed in our group of patients that leukocoria was the most important sign, more than 8 and 9%. So in Brazil, we start uh, making the red reflex tests as a law since 2004. Every child that was born in the maternity needs to have this test. We know that this test is, is not enough to make diagnosis, uh, but it's important to change the, the pediatrician view of this. This is an important paper that was published, and uh, it's about the red reflex examination and how the pediatrician looks uh, when this uh, makes part of the exam. Uh, af after a period of years, the pediatricians get used with this test. So they start to realize that the eye is uh, important uh, to be examined in the maternity and after during the, the, um, the exam of the kids. In 2002, we started doing campaigns like this with posters, telephone cards, and in the television in the radio, newspapers, and uh, we've sending these cards to all the pediatricians in the countries and to all the ophthalmologists. And we note that this changed the view of these uh, doctors about retinoblastoma that is a rare condition. But uh, this was not enough. So the next step was creating a national day of awareness uh, and encouraging early diagnosis of retinoblastoma. So every year in this date, we celebrate uh, the retinoblastoma day. And during all the week, we do a lot of things in the schools, hospitals, maternities, uh, together with the pediatrician society and ophthalmology society. And we reinforce the importance of the uh, early diagnosis. So it's not only um, uh, one campaign, but every year we have another campaign. We make a lot of pap uh, papers and posters, and we have published in the television and in the newspapers. 
Another thing that we start to doing is to turn off the lights of some important monuments in the country, like the Chris Redeemer uh, at the date. And at the same time, in all the states, we turn off the light of an important uh, monument. And this is uh, um, published in the television and remember the importance of the early diagnosis and the, the lose of sight of these children. So this is the, the first point. Everything is to make the early diagnosis uh, better. But it's not enough. We need to uh, uh, help this kid to have access to the effective, effective treatment. So we need to help the first healthcare to make sure that this kid is going to arrive in the effective treatment. We have kids from Amazon, for example. This kid was discovered by our campaign the, the uncle of this kid read in the newspaper about the sign of Leucocoria, and he lived in the middle of the forest. So we need more than, than the campaign. So what do we do? We have a free phone number, and even in the internet we have free access to these kids to, or the parents to find a place when they can send the, the child. So this phone work all the time, so everyone can assess. So we could plan uh, the trip of this kid. And the kid uh, traveled six days by boat in the Amazon River to Manaus, and then took a flight to Manaus to Sao Paulo to be seen by our group and be treated. So this is also important. No, not only the diagnose, the, the early diagnose, you need to make sure that the child came to the center to be treated. Uh, and also we need to have prepared professionals and research to receive these kids. So we have centers that we prepared to receive these kids with all the technology. This is a case that is an interesting case that we uh, make the diagnosis with the campaign. This ch child has trilateral disease. She went to uh, bone ma marrow transplantation and she, fortunately she is alive. And we have also technology to enforce that is important vision for this case. Someone today in the morning said that is important. Then I said this in the morning, that is important vision for these kids. Yes, it's extremely important. Some parents asking me what my kid will do without vision. I live in the middle of the forest and I'm afraid the animals can kill my kid. So it's, it's, uh, uh, we need to, to realize the difficulties of these families. And we uh, have the protection, prothesis, glasses and everything of the kids. And the last uh, but not uh, least is the treatment compliance. We need to give support to the child and family. Why? Because most of these children don't have money. So you need to have uh, money for transportation, house during the treatment, uh, nutrition. There are families that don't have nothing to eat and other kind of supports to uh, assure that this child will be finishing the treatment, to complete the, 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 the cycle of the treatment. And now we have a hospice care to the kids that we don't have more uh, treatment to do, but we need to support them even during this difficult period. So I think to finish, uh, is these three, three pillars that I, I, important. Early detection, treatment compliance, and access to treatment. If, uh, and we can translate in education, resources, and support. Thank you. Thank you very much to both my presenters for keeping us on time and your very interesting presentations, very informative. So I'll just briefly go over what Dr. Carlos Rodriguez sent me. 
the last. Yes, okay, right. Um, so let's, most of the presentation has been, um, other speakers have talked about this, so I'll just run through quickly. Next, uh, sorry. Okay, so he mentioned, he talked about the problems that are faced in um, developing countries, late diagnosis, which we've come across, priorities, early detection campaigns, example given, and partnerships that would help the, this work. And then growth, later on when you get the partnerships and you've started your treatment, then collaborative research um, programs to help growth of the various programs. And then it just shows what um, can be achieved. Most is achieved initially with minimal investment through early diagnosis, public awareness campaigns, as has we've seen th through both Honduras and Brazil. Then medium gain later on with moderate investment. Then later on when you're thinking of more complex treatment, there's little gain but major investment. So it's this part of the steep curve that we need to place a lot of emphasis in um, in developing countries early diagnosis, et cetera. Okay, and this just goes um, without saying that the most important thing is cure, 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 um, before we think of eye salvage and vision preservation in places where there are scarce, limited resources. Um, and we've talked this morning about treatment of intraocular retinoblastoma, unilateral, bilateral, and then extraocular retinoblastoma. So this just, shows, um, depending on the stage of the eye that we've spoken about today, you might consider in the developed countries and in some um, developing countries where they have um, cancer centers, ocular salvage for group A, and then, but obviously a nucleation group E eyes. And it talks about um, a nucleation and what has to be done and important to have the histopathology uh, by a specialist and good histopathology reported. And um, he talks about risk-adapted therapy depending on, as has been debated this morning, choroidal involvement, et cetera, et cetera, optic nerve involvement. And um, this just shows the various parts of the eye and the high-risk pathologies and adjuvant chemotherapy for high-risk pathology, being christine carboplatin, or in places where they can't give this, then being christine cyclophosphamide and doxorubicin, particularly in resource-poor settings. And this is just uh, uh, the flow chart, which I think was shown this morning on treatment of unilateral retinoblastoma. Then we come to bilateral disease, depending on uh, how it is, we know it's a dynamic process and tumors continue till about four to five years of age and treatment decisions depend on the state of each eye. And this is just the flow chart showing what physicians and ophthalmologists consider when treating bilateral retinoblastoma. So this shows the um, Central American experience, AHOPCA, and um, AHOPCA has various treatment guidelines and protocols for various diseases, including retinoblastoma. And um, there was a study done by um, Sandra Luna Feynman et al. presented in SIOP 2012, where there was upfront enucleation, and then enucleation delayed following two to three cycles of chemotherapy, especially where they felt the parents might abandon treatment because maybe there were some reservations about doing enucleation. Actually, some eyes were enucleated after about six cycles of treatment. And it shows the improved survival of those that had upfront enucleation compared to those with delayed enucleation. Then um, extra ocular retinoblastoma, as we all know, could be either orbital with cut end or optic nerve or uh, metastatic CNS or extra CNS, bone marrow, bone or liver. And um, based on this, treatment is given according, accordingly. And this shows extraocular retinoblastoma. We've seen a lot of these eyes today, so, and the um, 
involvement of the CNS. And some of the treatments that's given, depending on the, um, that the degree of the advancement, the staging, you might have to give, obviously, with those that require um, chemotherapy, you give platinum agents, carboplatin, etoposide, alkylators, and, or, and anthracyclines. Then enucleation, orbital excentration is not indicated, obviously. So if it's um, advanced, you would want to reduce the size of the tumor and make surgery safer, and then radiotherapy as well, as we've said. Metastatic retinoblastoma, which we've gone through already. Then this is a, a very important um, publication by Guillermo Chantan. Unfortunately, he, he couldn't be here today. I think he might be here tomorrow, if I'm right. Uh, which talks about the SIOP PODC recommendations for graduated intensive treatment of retinoblastoma in developing countries. Um, I sort of, in, yes. So depending on where we are, it's all, it all depends on the local context as to what you'd be able to offer. And ranging from palliative care for advanced cases, trying to reduce abandonment, enucleation, and other therapies. Um, so this, they've sort of, in their paper, they've grouped the centers into various settings, setting one, two, and three, and sort of it corresponds with the social, um, the World Bank classification, but, however, saying that in some setting two, you might have a, a good center where you'll be able to administer some of the treatment that is expected in an upper middle in income um, setting. So it ranges from minimal treatment to good um, focal treatment, et cetera. And high, and high dose chemotherapy with autologous stem cell transplant, et cetera. And um, this one just shows um, the management of the various um, stages of the eye and what can be done in the various settings, as we said earlier on. This um, is also in the publication. It just gives the drugs that are used, carboplatin, etoposide, vincristine, cyclophosphamide, vincristine, plus or minus doxorubicin, all the way down to um, iphosamide, etoposide, etc. And in some instances, intrathecal chemotherapy, although that is debated whether it is as effective or not. So finally, we've also, this has also been mentioned by um, Dr. Singh about the risk of secondary malignancies, a lot caused by radiation. So the risk of secondary malignancies is higher in the hereditary type much higher by the years, by 50 years from diagnosis, much higher in hereditary type. And also, it's related to radiotherapy. So as much as possible, where we can avoid that radiation, we should. This talks about trilateral, and which is obviously a poor prognosis, et cetera. And um, th that's about all the presentation. So I think now we are open for discussion. Thank you very much. So we, I think we've got about five minutes. Thank you for that. Um, Louis, I'm just wondering, with your program, did you ever get any pushback about um, f the high rate of potential false positives? So people coming with seeing leukocoria and it's not retinoblastoma at all. And also, I have had a lot of concern amongst, I guess, even the ophthalmology community that um, I may create an hysteria around children having cancer just because I say retinoblast um, leukocoria and strabismus may be signs of um, a, an intraocular cancer. Could you comment on any of those experiences? The, the first part uh, about the um, experience with uh, uh, false positive, uh, not all the kids come to Sao Paulo uh, 
uh, only by the local courier. We try to find a place, uh, a hospital with an uh, expertise ophthalmologist, like a retina specialist, to see the kid. If it's not a condition or, or a, uh, that is not a cancer, uh, so we stay in, in the town or in the state. If it's a uh, suspicious of re retinoblastoma or if it's a diagnosis of retinoblastoma, then we try to find uh, uh, the oncologist service that is going to take care of the kid. So this is, uh, uh, helps to uh, not have this uh, lose of money or time to send the, the kid w without necessity to Sao Paulo or another center. This is the first part of the, the, the question. The second part is uh, always when we uh, have uh, our uh, conference with the pediatrician, the Society of Pediatricians in Brazil and in the ophthalmologists, we have this concern about not creating a, a more uh, expectation uh, in the population. But uh, I think it's important to remember that sometimes we test disease in pediatrician that's uh, uh, more hair than retinoblastoma, like the, the metabolism tests. These conditions are more hair than, than, than retinoblastoma. And when you say about uh, leukocoria, you are not only testing for retinoblastoma, you are testing for all eye conditions that can um, cause uh, vision loss and other kind of things for the kids. So I think it's important uh, for other conditions like ROP, cataract, con congenital cataract, and glaucoma, and other disease. So I think it, this is not a problem, uh, doing this kind of campaigns. Um, I'll just add that um, our, my ophthalmologist, who's just sitting there, Vera, she trained some public health nurses just to use a torch, you know, when they the children came for their immunization just to check their eyes and uh, over a one year period and they did refer children suspect, suspected retinos but there were other conditions. At least it's helped pick up mm -hmm. other things that yeah. could be yeah. treated. Is that not we have a lot of codes this is treated uh, before retinal detection for example. And I have only one other thing. That kid from Amazon uh, we received the kid, we treated the kid with uh, astrocrore disease, and the mother was a community leader. And during the period that she was with us in Sao Paulo, we trained her uh, with the, the, um, uh, the indirect the direct ophthalmoscope. And when she came back, she started uh, doing the tests in the kids, and she discovered one or more two retinoblastoma. So you can do small things that change uh, huge things. I just wanted to comment also that um, there's, a, I mean, after you see all these images in our developing countries, there is a, it's an urgent uh, mobilization that is needed. Like, uh, it's not possible us to be sitting and, and, and not doing nothing. I mean, we, we need to educate our people, we need to have cancer awareness in order to be able to save more lives. And that's what it's all about. And, it, and it's never going to cause any hysteria. For example, we have worked a lot with the government also in initiatives to teach our medical and uh, the health uh, workers about uh, cancer awareness, not only about retinoblastoma. And the only ones who are uh, overloaded with the work are us, the pediatric oncologists in our referral centers. But it is worth it. It is worth it because uh, we are able, we know that we have to work harder and we have to talk to our authorities that there is more needed uh, support for uh, pediatric oncology in our settings. Uh, another thing that I just wanted to comment, it was about the experience that Dr. Carlos Rodriguez Galindo sent about the, the working together with twinning programs and how to uh, improve the care of our children through chemo, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Because uh, as the, the mother uh, of one of the children who came to this meeting said, uh, 
we, since we receive uh, more advanced cases of retinoblastoma, we are able to offer them chemotherapy in order to make it oper uh, to have the surgery done in a, a safer way. And, and, and I, I can tell you that we have been able to improve the survival of our children through that um, a way of doing things, a learning about what um, the situation is, an, an individual, individualized situation of each patient, a, trying to save more lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we got that. Uh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and just a comment from the PSYOP and uh, the Pediatric Oncology in Developing Countries Group, the PODC, is that over the last um, five years, PSYOP has been developing the framework that Carlos has presented, which is a setting-based framework, and it's about to be published. And the rationale for that is to, uh, it, it's quite detailed allowing centres and countries and regions to identify where they might sit from a on a level one, two, three, four. And it, it, it allows them to then identify what resources might be available and to match the treatments that uh, are available to the resources they have. And it's a, it, the intention is a, for it to be a tool to advocate with your uh, hospital administration and government agencies to say, we're in a level one or level two setting, we're in an emerging program and that the resources that we are seeking are reasonable and endorsed and supported by PSYOP and international organisations. So this is a, 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 a means to advocacy for, for the support that's required for start-up programmes. Thank you very much. A, a, a question which came <clears throat> through the, uh, the, the, the streaming. Um, it, it kind of follows on... Um, there was a slide up earlier which seemed to suggest that uh, having chemotherapy prior to enucleation would result in better outcomes. Um, where they are located in the state of Florida, they seem to think that many children have uh, the chemo first prior to enucleation. So the question was one of clarification. Um, was that what this slide seemed to suggest that enucleation before chemotherapy is better, or is it a case of chemotherapy? Even, and just to clarify, this is when enucleation is anticipated. I think you're talking about the Honduras um, experience that was published. That one rather, those that had chemotherapy upfront well, and delayed enucleation were worse. The outcome was worse. Um, it's, it's difficult to really know the indications really for the chemotherapy because they did say some of the parents did not want enucleation. So some of those children could have been enucleated up front and instead of maybe it progressed, the disease progressed. And some of them, they, had, they went, continued chemotherapy for up to six cycles, which is too long. Chemotherapy, we give it for those that are quite advanced, the proptotic eyes, you know, the sort of that you cannot, it's, it's, it would be risky to go ahead and operate immediately. And we usually would enucleate after about two cycles, once it's deemed safe enough by our, we don't go on any further, because it is shown that the longer you delay, the worse the outcome. We think that. So for intraocular retinoblastoma, it's either advanced intraocular disease, limited only to the globe, it's either enucleation or chemotherapy, uh, only enucleation. And if it's not advanced disease, then you start chemotherapy. But it's not, intent is never to say, oh, we're going to give chemotherapy and then we're going to remove the eye. Now, that's applicable to extraocular disease, but not, not to only ocular disease. So, so um, Dr. Chow from China published a paper a few years ago in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, um, which clearly showed that the mortality increased for group EIs treated with systemic chemotherapy for, before enucleation if it went longer than three months. So that's two or maybe three cycles only. And uh, after that time, the mortality was significant. That was about um, 90 eyes in that study. 
uh, and it was comparing those who got the chemo to not getting the chemo. Um, John is now preparing and has all the data on about 500 or 600 eyes similarly compared for EIs treated or not with um, chemotherapy before nucleation. And the mortality, if the, is ex the data is exactly the same, the mortality is 10% if they have go longer than three months of... And the reason is because of the high risk factors might be masked by chemotherapy. Correct, correct. So when they come to nucleation, you are not able to assess the high risk which may be masked by this half-dose chemotherapy or whatever. So that kind of makes it kind of even more complicated. Yes, and it might be escaping the eye all that time while you're um, not treating, while you're masking it, getting more drug-resistant tumors, so then it becomes very difficult to treat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you. Thank you.